Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Yeah. I have to first uh, thank Bloomberg for arranging this wonderful conference. Uh, being one of the sponsors, it has been a great pleasure for us at Barclays, and uh, we hope to continue this engagement. One thing I want to tell you is that, of course, I'm Japanese, I can speak Japanese, but I'm going to do my short presentation in English. Uh, this is high tech, but I have been informed that it's not only you in front of me, but there will be enormous amount of people sitting in front of their screens. And unfortunately, the simultaneous translation doesn't extend to those terminals. So that if I speak in Japanese, that quite a few of uh, the clients actually sitting in Hong Kong and Singapore will be able to understand what I'm saying. So apologies for that. Uh, so what I want to do in the next very short time, a very short presentation, the only obstacle between you and lunch, is to give or try to give you a glimpse of how we at Barclays are looking at the future of banking or whatever is currently called banking or the financial industry and what we are trying to do about it. And of course in this narrative, as you have heard in some earlier panels, interaction with so-called fintech or technology will be critical. Let us start by looking back at the relationship between fintech and the financial industry in the last 50 years. I think what we should do is to remember that fintech is not something that is new or just came about in the last five years, but it has been around with the banking industry for years. I have informed my head of digital technology that when IBM produced the first three computers on the planet, two went to the United States government and the last one went to a bank. Maybe the main difference between now and then, you can see all the waves, right at the beginning of the fintech, is that the original, originally the financial technology centered around the vendor position of providing platforms to connect in. Customers allow for large distribution of sell side products. Maybe I should say it was very bank centric. However, as technology evolved and the cost barriers were reduced, we started to see a new raft of fintechs emerging in the retail banking space, providing solutions to identify pain points in the banking workflow. I'm sure a lot of you in the room know better than me. Mobile technology led to a rise in crowdfunding, evolved into P2P lending, and then payments. As blockchain technology evolves, trade financing and DLT will see a rise, Big data has evolved into AI and MLL technologies, and we have seen cloud tech emerging to allow large swathes of the traditional tech stack moved on to cloud and reduce cost. Why is fintech accelerating now? I think we think there are about four reasons. There are a lot of reasons, but what we identify as maybe some of the key is one, the cost to launch new technology is cheaper and funding is easier. Maybe we can say it's easier to try and fail. You don't have to have a massive amount of capital borrowing capability to start something new. If you fail, you go to the next one. Two, changing consumer trends compresses adoption of new technology. Now, what does that mean? In the past, service started by the client like ourselves, thinking about myself, which is a pretty much of a dinosaur in this field, that you had to access a specific web page of the service provider like a bank and that's where you started. But these days, people have something like this, and I think that what they do on the smartphone, they decide to choose what they want to do, service, whatever, including the provider. And of course, there, I would say what they want to do and what they would prefer will change rapidly. On the other side of the coin, this also allows a service company like us to market to very specific segments if we wish to. Three, you can easily leapfrog legacy technology. What does that mean? The incumbents don't have an advantage, or maybe a disadvantage now. I would always say that a good example is when Barclays had a very large operation in Africa. I had the honor to go to Mozambique with the Prime Minister of Japan. And it was fascinating to see that they didn't have electricity, water, or even phones gas, anything, but somehow in the middle of nowhere they had, they had smartphone banking already. No telegraph poles, no infrastructure, but they went straight to something that we are struggling to catch up with. Four, we should also remember 
that regulatory change creates not only headaches, but also opportunities if you embrace change. We at Barclays ourselves found out, which was fascinating, I'm sure people have heard the word ring fencing. Uh, we had to create a bank called Barclays UK out of the original Barclays Bank as a UK, I would say, retail bank. What it resulted in was our own dedicated digital re retail challenger bank, effectively, within our group. Um, changing tack a little, this is to just show you that financial industry is not the first, nor the only industry to face fundamental wave of change. The first line, I'm sure in history books we learned about 40, they used to produce all the components of its cars, including tires within their company. This resulted in them even owning their own rubber plantation in Brazil. Second line, Tesla. Tesla thinks that the components of the cars are all commodities, so that they don't have to build it themselves. The purpose of the exercise is to get the best quality parts available. So their focus is to create the best customer experience by producing the best car the client wants. So in this changing world, how should large incumbents like us compete with the fintechs? I think in spirit of the corporation, we just have to work and rise together with them. We ourselves need to build a technology base that will give op optionality in partnering with the fintechs, allowing us the flexibility to manufacture core products, but also unbundle, partner, co-create in strategic areas we want to be a distributor. To do that, we need to be willing to offer best products and capabilities to the other institutions' clients through various distribution strategies. Also, we need to be willing to unbundle ourselves and replace non-core products and capabilities with best-in-class offering from third parties. And in all of this, we have to have a clear strategy on where we want to build by partner, based on where we have chosen to become a core manufacturer or large distributor. And let us just talk a little at the end about what we are doing at Barclays to cope with this exercise. This is a map showing the location of something called RISE, created by Barclays, which is a global community of the world's top innovators working together, connecting, creating, and scaling with us. This sometimes includes our own colleagues, young, sometimes not young, but aspiring colleagues. They are located around the world in New York, London, Vilnius, Tel Aviv, and Mumbai. No secret which they do. London is digital, retail, New York is more wholesale, Vilnius, cashless society, Tel Aviv, cybersecurity, Mumbai, that's where most of our operations are. And I think that you can see easily there's no borders in this kind of exercise. In closing my short presentation, I would like to be slightly rhetorical or political about this by stressing the need to embrace change. Barclays has been around for 328 years and will be celebrating actually 50 years in Japan next year in 2019. Uh, we have survived and evolved through multiple financial crises, international conflicts, as well as, if you think about from 1690, agricultural, industrial, and technological revolutions. We have started from being effective trading house like a Japanese shosha, because as London was originally more a port city than a financial city, but however, the increased accumulation of wealth necessitated the need for investment, resulting in the birth of the city of London, and Barclays evolved with it. A merger of 20 banks took place before we reached the current outline. And we will have continued to change and will continue to evolve to meet the requirements of times. Now, of course, as discussed in early panels, there is enormous uncertainty of the future of the open architecture of the global economy. And there, it will continue to be volatile and uncertain, involving politics. I'm not going to talk about Brexit because it will take two hours, but including things like that. But I think what I would like to conclude by saying that for all of us in the financial industry, we have to make sure we don't lose sight of the continuing need to be open-minded and embrace change. And including maybe the possibility that something called the boundaries of banking or the financial industry is going to disappear or get blurred with other things. And the background to that is we need to accept the fact that the status quo is probably not feasible anymore. With that, I would like to conclude. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much. <laughs>